Let's start out with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this time to come together and talk about this topic of calling. And we pray for your presence. Uh, we pray that, uh, that the scriptures that we talk about and these truths might be able to not merely remain in theory, but come down and touch us in practice in the concrete specifics of our lives. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts might be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Uh, this topic of calling is a very urgent matter for people, uh, especially uh, that are younger, say coming out of high school or coming out of college, but it's really important for people at all different stages of their lives. Because we always need to be able to refocus our lives and see more and more who God has made us to be and what, uh, given that, is the direction that we should go in our lives. Uh, as I've done various vocational uh, analyses, and this is something that I got into as a hobby. Uh, I'm more a theologian and apologist, but I started doing it probably 30 years ago because uh, I uh, learned from some people that were doing it professionally. And uh, I've asked questions to many, many people, hundreds of people throughout the years. And uh, there's certain common characteristics. Not everybody uses this language, but what I've found is that people want to make a difference in their lives. They want their lives to count in some way, whether it's just uh, on a small scale with their family, with their kids, whether it's in the uh, community or in a church, whether it's in the city, whether it's in a state, whether it's nationally in the United States, whether it's internationally uh, in a particular country. People want their lives to make a difference. Uh, and sometimes that difference is uh, different. I remember one uh, woman that shared with me that her deepest fear was that her life wouldn't make a difference. And I found that in, in many different places. I was once on a retreat with a, a college ministry from, from West Virginia, and I spoke on various other issues, but I also spent time with each of the individuals that were on the staff of that ministry. And we uh, you know, did that, and there was a young boy that was the son of the, the, the regional director of that ministry, a little boy by the name of Ben. Ben was about five years old, five, six years old. And he said, well, when's Art going to talk to me? So I, I said, okay, well, I'll talk to him. And right before dinner, uh, we got together and talked for a little bit. And he was sitting in a little kid's rocking chair. And, but he was a very alert, sharp young man. And, and I remember asking him the question, which I often ask, if you could do anything, Ben, if you had unlimited time, money, and you couldn't fail, what would you do? And he thought a little bit, and, and he said, I'd be a fireman and a coal miner. And I thought, well, fireman, I could understand, because I'd heard already stories about Ben playing with fire trucks, and he liked to climb trees uh, and do that kind of thing. But I said, Ben, you know, that's interesting. I understand the fireman part, but how about the coal miner? And I guess he had been around coal mines in uh, Virgin uh, West Virginia, and I'll never forget, he got a little smile on his face, a little gleam in his eye, and he said, well, I want to be a coal miner because you can get dirty. <laughs> <laughs> now, only a little kid makes it his main object and goal in life to get dirty. <laughs> I remember the story one time with his parents where uh, uh, he was out uh, on a, uh, right after the rain, and it was a great big mud puddle. Uh, he was a distance away, and, and he was looking at this mud puddle longingly. And his dad said, uh, Ben, <laughs> don't do it. And he looked at his dad, and he looked at, his, at the mud puddle, and he looked at his dad, looked at the mud puddle, and then finally he just jumped right in the mud puddle, <laughs> you know, and got all dirty. Uh, now, I'd say, other than that, uh, the commonality is that, that people want their lives to make a difference. Uh, and... I think there's a crisis in this area of calling uh, in this culture for a number of different reasons, and that's what I'd like to talk about in our time that we have before us now. 
uh, I think the crisis starts in a larger level in terms of worldviews. Uh, people that are secular or materialist or atheist that uh, don't believe that there is necessarily any uh, objective meaning or purpose in life have no God there to call. And yet the language of vocation and calling is still used in a number of books that are secular, but it leaves, uh, begs the question, who is there that will call you? Same thing with respect to the New Age movement or the advent of Eastern religious perspective in our culture. Uh, they believe in the principle that all is one or uh, that things are non-distinct. Uh, there's no ultimate distinction between you and me, between me and a chair, between me and this podium. Uh, there, there are no distinctions anywhere. But of course, if there are no distinctions, then there's no distinction between you and a God that's separate or distinct from you that can then call you into doing things. And so often that, uh, that calling or vocation is reinterpreted as just coming out of your own feelings. But there's nothing objective there with respect to creation that would lead you there to call. So that in both secularism, the all is matter perspective, and the uh, new age, which is the all is spirit perspective, or all is one perspective, uh, there's no one there to call, yet the language of calling is used. Uh, I think also there's been a crisis because the church has largely failed to address this topic. In fact, it's still, I, I remember talking about this for the first time 20 years ago, and even though there are glimmers of hope here and there, I still think that uh, the church has failed to understand its heritage uh, in this arena. Ca came across a number of years ago a, a quote by William Deal, part of a book called Christianity in Real Life. He was someone who was a businessman, worked as, in management at one point in a steel company up in Pennsylvania. I don't know exactly where he's gone since then, but uh, in his prologue, in, in the beginning of the book, he had this quote. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of certain quotes that just stun you and, and you jump off the page and, and become decisive and uh, I know I have a system of circling and, and putting arrows towards it and starring uh, at various levels uh, quotes that are important. Maybe underline is just fairly trivial and then a uh, little line and arrows and stars and then circle and then uh, circle not only the, the, uh, the quote but then the page number on the top so that I'm really drawn to it. Well, this is one of these quotes that jumped off the page and I still think that it's yet to be fulfilled. Here's what he says. He says, I'm now a sales manager for a major steel company. In the almost 30 years of my professional career, my church has never once suggested that there be any type of accounting of my on-the-job ministry to others. My church has never once asked to improve those skills which could make me a better lay minister, nor has it ever asked if I needed any kind of support in what I was doing. There's never been an inquiry into the types of ethical decisions I must face or, or whether I seek to communicate my faith to my co-workers. I've never been in a congregation where there's any type of public affirmation of a ministry in my career. In short, I must conclude that my church doesn't really have the least interest in whether or how I minister in my daily work. Again, notice this, accounting of my on-the-job ministry to others. My church has never once offered to improve the skills. Uh, any kind of support in my profession, uh, inquiry into types of ethical decisions I must face, uh, never any affirmation of a ministry in my career. I, I still look out, and I've yet to see a church that's fully worked out these areas. Uh, what churches do you have that uh, have people come forward and have a laying on of hands uh, for people in their jobs in politics or business or whatever arena they're in? So that the idea of being called by God uh, to work in the world and be equipped in all these ways uh, has yet to be done in churches. It's part of the reason that the C.S. Lewis Institute was founded. Uh, the purpose statement of the Institute is, and the legacy of Lewis, to develop disciples that can articulate, defend, and live faith in Christ through personal and public life. And the Institute was founded in part because that kind of discipleship was not happening for people that were in the professional world. And um, there are many sharp people in congregations in D.C., but that's true throughout the country, that 
may have been, and often not, discipled in a deeper level in their personal life, but especially this discipleship in terms of public life is something that uh, is still beginning to be done uh, to be able to apply your faith in specific ways in, in all these areas of life, including your work. And so that's the gap in some ways that the C.S. Lewis, however strugglingly and however uh, inadequately, I mean, we're beginning to try to address that issue uh, in people's lives. And it's very important that, uh, that we can do it, but that churches will take that up as well, to be able to see the importance of a deeper discipleship, number one, uh, but then that this discipleship that equips you not only for personal life, but for public life. Uh, another aspect of the crisis here in the area of calling is the loss of the work ethic. Uh, many, in many cases, work is seen as a necessary evil. I go back to an old film and song, uh, Nine to Five. And that, that ethic is still very much there in the culture. You work nine to five, uh, there's the countdown from Monday to Friday, and you even have a, a restaurant chain that has taken its uh, name from that, it's TGIF. What does that stand for? Everybody knows, thank God it's Friday. Uh, uh, William Deal wrote a later book called Thank God It's Monday <laughs> to reverse that perspective, to see that we are really created to work. We're not just created for the weekend. Now, I suppose the nine to five idea is there because, and, and, and tragically it's true, much of work can be a drudgery or something that's necessary to make a living. But there needs to be an addressing of that issue and seeing how much it is that God has created us to work and try to find ways to be able to get people to use their gifts in the best way possible and to, to develop them. Uh, another issue that's part of this crisis in the work ethic is unrealistic expectations that people have for their work. Uh, if you go to the internet now, and put in, put in uh, quarter life crisis, you'll find that people are having cr a crisis with respect to work earlier. You have many, many young people that are very competent. They go to college. They've gotten grades. They may have been uh, valedictorian or at least uh, cum laude, summa cum laude, uh, whatever it is in their high school. And they all go on and they're, they do incredibly well at the university and college. They go on to graduate school. And yet they find when they get in, into their professions that it's, uh, first of all, not as fulfilling as they had hoped it would be. And they also find that they're not immediately, in many cases, in most cases, thrust into the kind of positions that they anticipated. And they see quite a while to go before they, if they ever get there, <laughs> quite a while before they uh, even have the opportunity to do so. So it, it can be discouraging to look at the long haul. And, and you have all these expectations and dreams uh, that are uh, unrealistic, and they don't understand the way things happen uh, in the real world. And when you add to this that there's been a great confusion between uh, work and calling, uh, that adds to the problem. Uh, let me just say this, and we'll develop this more as we go along, that calling is not limited to or equated with work. Again, calling is not limited to or equated with work. Calling uh, is really the larger category, the umbrella. Work is just one aspect uh, of calling. Uh, the word, By the way, the word calling comes from the, a Greek word, kaleo, the word vocation. It comes from the Latin uh, vocatio, and both really essentially mean the same thing. Uh, you could decide that you want to use those words in, in different ways, in specific ways, but they essentially mean the same thing, one from the Greek uh, calling and the other from the Latin vocation. So that they both mean the same thing. Well, let me give you some thoughts, first of all, on the topic of work from a theological perspective, from a theological context. Uh, and this is very important for us to grasp. Uh, it could be revolutionary for the church if they're to recover this perspective. There is within Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28, a very important passage. It's right after the creation in Genesis 1, uh, and you have the, uh, the idea that people are created in the image of God, and they're given a specific task. 
Now, this has to do with who we are in terms of our own worth and value and dignity, and it also has to do with what we're created to do and to be. So it's very decisive. It's very important for the whole biblical worldview that we stop and look, take a careful look at it. And I think the church has, by and large, neglected this passage. And because it has, the way people's lives are lived are lived according to a, a skewed set of priorities. Let me just read it to you. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own Im image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Well, notice a couple things about this passage. First of all, it says, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And then in verse 27, And God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. Now, this idea that we're made in the image of God uh, is one of these ideas that is there, but we don't know, we don't know or don't realize in, in most cases how radical this perspective is and how important it is to the way our culture is set up. In fact, uh, Eric Erickson, who's secular and as far as I know, not a believer, uh, he's a psychologist, said, uh, uh, really looking for the idea, the dignity uh, of the human person, said that, you know, if we talk about dignity, uh, perhaps there's no other concept that really allows us to give a reason for it other than people are made in the image of God. And this idea has been radical. It's very much at the root of America, U the U.S., uh, and the West, the idea of individual human dignity, that people are given certain inalienable rights, such as the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, given to them by God, uh, that people have an inherent dignity. Each individual is made in God's image. That means they have inestimable value. Uh, it's connected with uh, who God is, so that if God is of great worth and worthy to be worshipped, and you are made in His image, that means you have, you have incredible worth and value and dignity. In fact, C.S. Lewis said in light of that, in his classic essay, Weight of Glory, uh, there are no ordinary people. You have never met a mere mortal. The people you're sitting next to, sitting next to you, the, person, the people you meet in every place, at the gas station, at 7-Eleven, at, at a restaurant, uh, people you meet every day are going to live forever either under salvation or judgment. That means people have uh, a tr tremendous worth, value, and dignity. I think we've yet to fully appropriate that. Just think of every day in the way that you greet people. You don't have to become pushy or over the top, but every, every person you look at, uh, think that this person is made in God's image. How would that affect the way you look at people? and the way that you speak to people. Uh, I would say it's one of these ideas that's yet to be fully appropriated. Uh, I don't even know to what percent it is appropriated within our culture. It's been radical in shaping uh, America, the land of opportunity, that each, each person, even the poorest person, has the opportunity to say, be president of the United States. At least that's the vision. Now, not, not everybody has the gifts, of course, to be president of the United States, but at least the opportunity is there for each person. There's a dignity inherent within people, and there, there's opportunity that ought to be given to them. That's why there's freedom in the political arena, and why economic freedom is a good thing, to try to give people opportunity for education, opportunity uh, to be able to do what they can with the gifts that they've been given, not to be stopped in by lots of external factors from being able to express the gifts that God has given them. In any case, uh, that's been very much at the root of our culture. Uh, it's hard uh, to overestimate it. 
it's very easy to take it for granted and not see where its roots come from. And especially when you go to other countries where that's not present. The dignity of the individual is not present. I just heard Vishal Mangawadi in his new book, the uh, book that created your, your world, uh, talk about India and how uh, the, uh, this idea of individual human dignity is not present, especially with respect to women. And talks about cases where young girls, babies, were allowed to die, uh, really starved to death, because their life was thought to be not of great worth and it would be very difficult and involve suffering. And the idea of individual human dignity is not rooted there uh, within that system. Uh, just came back from Mexico where, again, that this idea of the individual human dignity, say, of orphans and widows. We went to an orphanage and talked to a pastor and various people there, and, and, and very little attention given to uh, the dignity of people that are poor, because poverty is so rampant. And, and even in the, the churches, the Hispanic churches that are down there, uh, there's not that kind of emphasis there in, in many cases. So the idea of individual human dignity and its importance uh, is crucial. And notice what it says about people made in the image of God. Now, it says, let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And again in verse 28, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So twice it talks about the idea of exercising rulership, or you could use the word dominion, over the whole creation. Now, I've been involved a lot and read a lot of works from people in the New Age movement or in the Eastern religious perspective and heard them speak about this Christian view of dominion. And sometimes the way that they portray it, and uh, it is possible to abuse this idea, is that this dominion has given uh, Christians, the license to rape and pillage the earth, to be able to not care about the environment. However, I think that when you look at this idea of dominion, it's not been understood or appropriated uh, in the way that it ought to be. Uh, on the one hand, with respect to environment, I think uh, believers should be in the forefront of dealing with environmental issues. Uh, just look at a book written a number of years ago by Francis Schaeffer, Pollution and the Death of Man, and you'll get something of that legacy that Christians are called to and why, uh, not only from this passage, from, but from many others. There's a great passage in uh, Genesis 2.15 that says this, it, uh, Then the Lord took the man and put him into the garden to cultivate it and keep it. And the Hebrew words there are to serve it for cultivate, it's another way you could uh, articulate it, or to keep, to protect and preserve the garden so that the call very early is to uh, dominion and rulership does not mean rape and pillage or use or destroy the environment around you. It means to cultivate, to serve the creation, and to protect and preserve it. In fact, the way this passage is put, and I don't want to overemphasize this, but it looks more like... Uh, Man is put in the uh, in the garden for the sake of the garden, rather than the garden there for the for the man and woman. Now, I don't want to overemphasize that, but on the other hand, the, the call is very strong to preserve uh, the creation. Uh, I would say, on top of that, th this idea to rule or exercise dominion could be articulated in different ways. In fact, this is often called, and I don't want these names to put you off from understanding the radical character of this. It, that, that name is often called the cultural mandate. Uh, this is the mandate to exercise uh, your gifts and abilities to be able to uh, deal with the creation. In this particular case, it's dealing with the animals and dealing with the land and planting things and uh, being fruitful and multiply. It, it's to use your giftedness with respect to the creation. Again, the cultural and to develop the culture around you. And this is what we're called to do as human beings. You start in a more primitive way in the garden, but the Bible starts in a garden, but ends in a city. At the end of the book of Revelation, you have the city of God come down with all of its beauty and complexity and buildings and walls and 
Uh, and despite the fact that I'm sure there's metaphor there, as well as pointing to something that's literal, it shows that, that the creativity of people has been expressed in creating all of these uh, beautiful things. So that this uh, cultural mandate, or sometimes called creation mandate, is right at the very center of human beings. Let me put it in a different way. That we're called as, as people in the image of God to develop the potential of the creation around us or to use our creativity with respect to the creation. Uh, I would call it a, a, a creativity mandate or a call to creativity. And I would say that when this is not emphasized, the cultural mandate or the creation mandate, there's a crisis in creativity. The people are not called to develop the potential of their, uh, of their gifts. God has given us certain created or natural gifts. Like, for instance, you look at Exodus 31, and you'll see this is just one of many, many, many examples. You have uh, a couple people, uh, Bezalel and oh Oholiab, uh, that are gifted artists that are called to work on the issues with regard to the tabernacle. And th then throughout Exodus 31, it gives all the specifics of the tabernacle. There's a very detailed blueprint and design for everything. But God was not just satisfied in having people that are, in a natural way or created way, gifted with respect to the arts. He actually it said, and it emphasizes in this passage, in the hearts of those who are skillful, I have put skill, or I put my spirit uh, on them. That the implicit idea here is that often, as a result of the fall, our gifts are withered, and they, they have not yet come to full flower. They, they, they have not developed according to their potential. And what God does is not only in this case uh, of Bezalel and Aholiab uh, take their gifts, and they're already gifted artists. They were chosen among many to, to do this tabernacle, but he's given his, his spirit so that they not, they not only have the blueprint, but they have uh, enhanced abilities, or perhaps their abilities can come to their full potential as a result of God's work and God's spirit. So that God can do that. He can, with each one of you, uh, you are given gifts and God can allow those gifts by his spirit uh, to allow them to uh, unfold, come to full flower. And that's true in every area, in the artistic area, in the musical area, in, uh, in, in dealing with animals or horses, in dealing with uh, uh, wood as a carpenter, and dealing with computers, and dealing with any area, God can allow the gifts or orientation you have to come to full flower. And when this uh, dominion man mandate or cultural mandate or uh, that creativity mandate uh, is not emphasized, people don't see that their gifts are not just natural, they're given to them by God. They don't look for the purpose of what God has created them to be. They have a very narrow view uh, of their Christianity or of their faith or, or what they're called to be doing. Uh, and I'd say another thing that people that are created in the image of God and another part of this uh, cultural mandate uh, or creativity mandate is the idea that we're to use our creativity, as I emphasized. Uh, it's not so much, and I don't like the word that's used in the New Age movement and sometimes picked up by believers, Sometimes the word is used of co-creator, that we're called to be co-creators with God. And I suppose there's a truth to that, in that God is the, uh, the creator, and we're also given creativity as made in the image of God. But uh, we're not quite on the same level. Uh, I would say that God, only God can create something out of nothing. Now, we're, we can, as people made in the image of God, uh, create uh, something out of something. Uh, we, we can take clay and make a pot out of it. We can take wood and make beautiful a uh, carpentry uh, out of it. Uh, we can use our creativity with respect to the creation. So I prefer the word sub-creator. Uh, that, uh, that's the word that, that Tolkien uses, that we're sub-creators. We're, but we're given creativity. Francis Schaeffer likes that word sub-creator. Uh, that we are made to be creative, to use our gifts with respect to the creation. That's why we were made. And, and what has happened in the church is, is that things have been narrowed down. 
uh, there has been, and I'll try to explain this to you, uh, a two-chapter gospel rather than a four-chapter gospel. Again, there's often been in the church a two-chapter gospel rather than a four-chapter gospel. Uh, the focus in many cases has been on uh, the two chapters. Uh, the four chapters are creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. Uh, the two chapters that are often focused on by the church is the fall, that we're sinners, and we need to be saved by God's grace. That's particularly true with regard to uh, evangelical Christianity. And so, uh, what you find is that in many cases, uh, the emphasis of the church has been on the Great Commission. Uh, and it should be on the Great Commission, but I think there's an inadequate understanding of it that excludes the cultural mandate or the mandate to creativity. Here's the Great Commission at the end of Matthew, Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All right, notice what, what the call is. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Uh, and what the church is focused on is go, therefore, and make converts. Go, therefore, and preach the gospel, talk about sin, talk about salvation, talk about be people being born again. And that's a good thing. I'm not, what I'm saying, I'm not speaking at all against the preaching of that gospel, of speaking about uh, sin and speaking about salvation from sin and individual redemption and being born again. That's a very good thing. But that the gospel is much more than that, or even the Great Commission is much more than that. Notice what it says there. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Now, conversion is just the first step, or being born again is just the first step uh, in that process of making disciples. And so uh, that's part of the mandate that the Institute is trying to fulfill and encourage churches to pursue this idea of discipleship. Uh, make disciples of all nation, nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so that idea of baptism, initiating people into the body of Christ. But even more than that, you look at uh, verse 20. Uh, what's the call in terms of discipleship? Uh, it's teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So what you have here is that uh, you're called to teach them all that I've commanded you. Teach them what le Paul later calls the whole purpose of God or the whole counsel of God. Teach them the whole perspective. What churches have then focused on is uh, the two chapter, the fall in individual personal redemption and not taught the whole picture. Not what, not uh, taught what I would call the, the four chapter gospel, that you have creation and God has created people in the image of God. And you have uh, the first effects of the fall uh, in Genesis uh, chapter 3 are uh, in all kinds of different arenas. If you look at uh, Genesis uh, 3, verse 14, it says this, and The Lord said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle. And it goes on down to the woman, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. So there's that early promise of redemption, what's called the Proto-Evangelion. It goes on in verse 16, To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain uh, in childbirth, and in pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So you have an initial effect of the fall in the, the marriage relationship. It goes on in verse 17 to say, Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. You shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for from it you are taken. Uh, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Uh, so that you have the effect of the fall on the relationship between the man and the woman. 
but there's even an effect of the fall on the ground. It says, cursed is the ground. There's something in the stuff of creation, somehow or another, uh, that uh, the fall or sin deeply penetrates to touching the ground and has effects uh, on our work as well. Our work uh, becomes more difficult in more ways than one. It, it ha it's more difficult inside to get ourselves going. There's the issue of laziness or uh, one of the seven deadly sins, sloth. That's one of the, the couple most deadly of sins because it's very difficult to get ourselves motivated sometimes to do the things that we really ought to do. Uh, so the resistance is inside the work, and the resistance is now also from the outside. It says, cursed is the ground and thorns and thistles. It, it shall you know, yield and make much more difficult to accomplish the work that you have to accomplish. So that the uh, effect of the fall is... Uh, not only on us individually, but on relationships, and I would say certainly on the corporate level of our relationships, not only uh, with the husband and wife and in families, but uh, throughout the culture, it's a corporate uh, uh, effect of the fall. And there's also uh, uh, a larger effect upon work and upon our profession or the, the things that we do uh, within the world. And I would suggest that the fall has penetrated all these areas, including what we're created to do and to be, and redemption comes in to address all these areas, uh, to not only uh, deal with us individually with respect to redemption, it certainly does that, I want to un underemphasize that, but uh, redemption comes in to deal with us and move us uh, into the corporate. We're redeemed into the body of Christ. We're, we're redeemed to, uh, to love the Lord our God, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And part of what God does is give us the Spirit uh, to enable us not only to be born again, but to enable us to uh, go out and be reconciled to people, go out and love people, go out and care for people, go out and be involved in the body in a, co in a corporate way. So redemption is not only individual and corporate, but I suggest also, and this is what the church has often missed, that redemption is cosmic as well, that it has to do with respect to the whole creation. Uh, look at, uh, there are many passages. I'm just going to give you a couple here. Uh, in Acts 3.21, the ultimate destination, the Apostle Paul says, is the restoration of all things. Everything that the fall has affected will be redeemed. And we see redemption applying to all areas of life and to all things. The individual the corporate and the cosmic. There's a, uh, the kingdom of God is the kingdom of God has come, but uh, the idea is that that rulership or reign is to be spread. Uh, we're to bring Christ's lordship to bear in every single area of life, not only our individual and personal lives, but our family life, our life as a citizen, our life in the church, and our life uh, in the world, in our professions. We're to bring the lordship of Christ uh, to be present there. Uh, another passage, Romans 8, 19 to 23. I won't take time to read it right now, but you have the idea that, uh, that the whole creation waits on tiptoe, anticipating the redemption of the children of God. And that means that the creation will participate, and that's the hope there, in that redemption. I think we skip over that. And think, well, it's just metaphor. Well, it's a metaphor to be sure. It's personification. But there's a real truth to it as well, that the whole creation will participate uh, along with the redemption uh, of the people of God. Uh, or in Revelation 21, verse 1, and many other passages within Scripture, we talk, we talk about the new self. The Scripture talks about the new self or the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, and that kind of language echoes right throughout the New Testament, the idea of new. Well, there are a couple Greek words for new. One is neos, that would be N-E-O-S, which essentially means, and I'm having to oversimplify uh, for the purpose of giving this talk, but it would be worth going back and doing a linguistic study of both of these words. But I'm just going to say right now that neos means totally new. And there's another Greek word for new called Kainos, K-A-I-N-O-S, and that means renewed. Guess which word is used almost every time the Bible speaks about new? 
Neos, totally new, or Kainos, renewed? Well, you probably guessed it from the way I set it up here. Uh, it's Kainos, renewed. A renewed heavens and renewed earth. There will be a profound discontinuity between the earth as we see it now and the new heavens and new earth, but there will also be a continuity. And people have speculated, like Anthony Hokum in his book, Created in God's Image, whether perhaps the best of human creation will uh, be there in the new heavens and new earth. Uh, the best songs, the best artistic works, the, the best things that people have created. Who knows? I'm not saying that I know exactly what will be, but it's not inconsistent uh, with what it seems that, that the biblical pattern portrays. In any case, this uh, idea that you have the creation and the fall has impacted us, impacted the creation at all these levels, personal, corporate, and cosmic. Redemption uh, uh, applies to all these areas, uh, personal, corporate, cosmic. And the consummation will allow us to, for all eternity, not sit as angels on a cloud playing harps, but being able to use our creativity and our gifts in incredible ways for all eternity. Uh, that's, that's the vision. That's the four-chapter gospel. Uh, that's the big picture of things. And what that means is that, for instance, in your work now, uh, that you're not just working to make a living. You're not just working to make money. Uh, to be able to give to mission, although that's a good thing. <laughs> Again, I don't want to uh, put that down, but sometimes the impression is given that people in the world can make big money so that they can support people in full-time Christian ministry. And again, that's a good thing, but that's that's not the main purpose for people to be in work. I mean, that can be a side effect uh, of it. Also, the idea is you're there in work primarily to share the gospel. And perhaps that's the main thing you can do, is to uh, share the gospel with your co-workers. Now, that's a good thing when given time or opportunity. Uh, I might just give a little parenthesis here. I won't spend a lot of time on it. There are times where it may be very inappropriate for you to share the gospel, not only because of the closeness of people, but because it could, if you're taking an hour to talk to someone about the gospel when you should be working, uh, that could be actually a dishonesty or stealing or something like that. So that there are times and places where it is appropriate. I don't want to minimize that or say that it's wrong. But is that the main purpose? Are those the two main purposes for work? No. It's to use your creativity with respect to your job, to do it in the best way possible, to develop the potential of the job that's in front of you, to use your creativity to, say if you're uh, in a business, to create wealth for all kinds of purposes. Uh, so that there's a, a place with, just with respect to the job that you're trying to be what you're created to be in the work world. It's not just for uh, a utilitarian thing. Uh, it's more true to say, Dorothy Sayer says, it's more true to say that we live to work than that we work to live. It's more true to say that we live to work than, we, than that we work to live. Now, you do need to make a living. And it says that people need to provide for their families. And if you don't, that's a very serious issue. Uh, it, she also argues this. It's more true to say that we play to work than it is true to say that we work to play. And this is, uh, with respect to the culture, I would say that the, it's, it's reversed. That we work in order to, for the weekend, so we can play. We work so we can have the vacation. We work so that we can retire from work. Now, there are truths that are there, I suppose. It's a good thing to be able to have time off and to have leisure. It's a good thing to have vacations. Good thing to be able to step back from one kind of work, hopefully to move into another uh, that more suits you or to have more time available. But it totally inverts the biblical priorities for things that I've already expounded. So this is a very important issue. And I don't know of... Uh, really any place where this is fully realized, say a church or a group of churches where this is really put forward as important and emphasized and worked out in detail. 
So it's a, it's a serious issue for the church to address. And there are real consequences for them, for them not addressing it. A very truncated view of the gospel, a very uh, lack of focus on the body, and a lack of focus on our work in the world and why we're created, on who we're created to be. So if there's not this place of the public life emphasis, that uh, there's something profa- profoundly missing. Well, let me quickly go through uh, this issue of calling in Scripture and move to the practical idea. Uh, calling, as I mentioned before, is the larger umbrella topic. We see a number of places where calling is used in Scripture, like Romans 1.6 talks about the calling of Jesus Christ, or Romans 1.7, that we're called as saints. Romans 8.28, called according to his purposes. Romans 8.30, whom he called, he justified. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, we're called out of darkness into his marvelous light. The largest calling, the main purpose of calling, is we're called into relationship with our, our Lord and Savior. To not only uh, with, in relationship to him as Savior, but in relation to him as Lord. And that, of course, has consequences for every single area of our lives, including our work. But we have to see the calling as being the larger umbrella issue, and then all kinds of other areas uh, underneath that will come back in our application to address that. But there's very little, if any, passages. In fact, there's only one that addresses particular calling, and even then, it doesn't specifically deal with job. Now, I don't have time in what I'm doing now to go through in detail this uh, classic passage in 1 Corinthians uh, 7, verses 17 to 24, but uh, here's what it says in 17. As the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner, let him walk. Or let each man remain in that calling in which he was called. Or in, that's in verse 20. Or in verse 24, let each man remain in that calling in which he was called. So uh, the idea here is that uh, when we're called or become believers, we're not to very quickly change our profession uh, to feel that we have to go into full-time ministry or something as soon as we uh, become believers, but we're to stop and really look at what God has called us to do. Now, it does mention a couple instances in this passage, which I won't develop right now, the idea of circumcision and slavery, and particularly with regard, with regard to slavery, it says if you have the opportunity to be free, by all means, um, allow yourself to be free or take the opportunity uh, to choose freedom so that you can move outside of uh, slavery into freedom. But it doesn't deal specifically with job, but it does indicate that there is a particular calling, that this larger calling relates to specific issues uh, in life. Uh, and it calls us not to quickly change that or in a presumptuous or precipitous way, but really consider who God has made you to be and who you are called to be specifically. What the specific implications are of that general calling for your for specific areas of your life. Well, what are the implications of calling in a larger way? Well, I'd say the primary uh, uh, Im- importance or purpose of this idea of calling is a calling to faithfulness to the Lord. Uh, in other words, we are, we are to be faithful in all the areas that God has called us to live. Like in relationship to Him, we're to be faithful in our relationship with Him. And part of the Fellows Program is to focus on reading scripture and prayer, and there's certainly a great importance in our devotional lives and having an ongoing way of being in relationship with him and practicing the presence or living our lives quorum Deo before the face of the Lord or uh, continuing to know God in an intimate and personal way. That's very important. But also God calls us into relationships with a family. If you're married, uh, say a, a husband with a wife or wife with a husband, and if you have children, to be called to be faithful with respect to your children. Uh, as a citizen uh, of a country, that we're called to be faithful as a citizen, to live out our lives in that arena. Uh, if you're in a church, you'd be faithful uh, as a member of the body, realizing that your gifts are important uh, in the body. The same gifts that God has created you to have, uh, that you express, hopefully, within, within the world, you can also express with regard to the church. And if you don't express those gifts, what you have is unavailable to the church. And also, by the way, what what you lack is un, is unprocurable, or what you lack you can't get, because other people have gifts that they contribute 
that they can contribute to you to make you richer or to deal with areas that you can't provide for yourselves. We really do need people to, com to complete us or to bring us to fullness of who uh, we should be. And also, we need to be called, we, part of our calling is this area of work. Uh, no one calling is to drive out the others. The great temptation in Washington, D.C. and in many other parts of the country is that work will drive out, working uh, 40, 60, 80 hours a week, will drive out the other callings and, and help and really make us be unfaithful to our time uh, in relationship to God, our time with our families, uh, our time with the church, uh, no one area is to drive out the others. We need to sit down and be faithful to the Lord in all the different areas that he's called us to pursue. Uh, I know a man I talked with recently that had a, a job on Wall Street, but it was so consuming that he couldn't, he was very successful at it. He was probably number two most respected uh, opinion maker on Wall Street, rated that by Forbes magazine. But he felt like he couldn't sustain that and still have time with his family. So he took, he left that you know, very prestigious place and took another job because he really wanted to be faithful to his family. Now, it doesn't provide a mandate. I'm glad that there are people at the top of Wall Street, but it's very difficult in some jobs to be able to do the job and do it well uh, and not be consumed by it. In any case, we need to deal with, with being faithful to the Lord in all these areas of calling. Calling also gives us perspective uh, on success or failure can give us sustained motivation. Uh, if we know who the Lord has made us to be and, and our calling in these various areas, uh, then we can continue to pursue it, even though it's difficult and painful, even, even though uh, success may not uh, come uh, quickly or maybe not in the way that we think of it at all, uh, not in the way we expect from it. It may not come, but we're sti we still know who we are to be and what what we are uh, to do. It's a matter of faithfulness, not a matter of success in some uh, expected fashion. Uh, it's a, a calling uh, to be faithful and not to compromise. Uh, I know uh, various people that uh, live their lives in that way. One guy on Capitol Hill was chief of staff for a congressman. I used to ask him, what are your ambitions? And he would always say uh, that, he wanted to last the year. And I thought, you know, he could go on to be a congressman himself. And he said, well, my, my problem is that any day my congressman might call me to do something uh, that would call me to co compromise my conscience, and I'd have to walk away from my job. And his favorite line was a line from the book of Esther, where uh, Esther says, if I perish, I perish. You know, I might have to perish with respect to my ambitions or with respect to this particular job because of what, what, what I'm called to do. I have another friend that uh, ended up being a whistleblower in a government uh, agency uh, out in another state. And he found out something that was dishonest and he was towards the end of his career, right ready to pursue retirement. And he decided he had to blow the whistle and there could have been great consequences. Uh, fortunately, the governor of that state took up his cause and he ended up being a hero. Uh, but and he ends up speaking all over the place on business ethics. But instead of that, it could have been that he would have gotten crushed. But he decided because he was faithful to Christ and he, that, that he would do it. And he's now had an opportunity when he goes to speak in many arenas to share that this is why I did it, because I was faithful to the Lord. I saw a film uh, uh, just very recently called Courageous. will be out in, uh, very soon. And part of that story is a, a man that's, really needing a job desperately and finally finds one and he, he's going to be moved into management but there's there's a a call to uh, by the by the leaders if you're going to be in management you, you got to write down uh, when we get this uh, uh, shipment in write down 16 boxes even if they're 17 and if you're willing to do this we'll hire you as manager and give you much more salary and he desperately needs it and he has no way to support his family if he doesn't get it and he comes back at 10 o'clock the next morning and says, you know, as a believer, I cannot do it. And both of the people there smile and say, well, you've passed the test. We wanted to see if you'd really be honest. And six people were tried before, and they all 
compromise. Now, fortunately, that was the case, although sometimes it's not. Sometimes the call will be to compromise. C.S. Lewis says sometimes that temptation will come uh, not in a, uh, a way that is uh, very blatant, but someone will look across the desk at you and say, we always do it this way. And you would hate to see that smiling, uh, accepting face turn into a scowl or a frown. So that there's a great temptation to compromise we have to watch out for. Calling is not just finding the perfect use of our gifts. Uh, we are to be good stewards, all things being equal, to use our gifts wisely. Uh, we should try to, if possible, find ways to use our gifts in the most effective way within the church or in the world. But, but we don't live in a perfect world. We live in a fallen world. Even if you were to be in the perfect situation, you'd find it wasn't perfect because you are imperfect and uh, your, uh, that y you are imperfect and people around you are not perfect. So the fall touches even the most perfect job in the most perfect situation. Uh, that we're to be involved in using our gifts and not presumption. We're to take as far as possible uh, the lower place and not try to push ourselves presumptuously into the higher place. That doesn't mean you should be passive, but it does mean that uh, only the Lord knows when you're ready to take the higher place. Uh, Francis Schaeffer used to use the idea that, uh, that you need to be willing to take the lower place and wait for the Lord to extrude you, like uh, toothpaste is ex extruded uh, out of the, uh, out of the uh, container there. Uh, wait for the Lord to extrude you. Again, that doesn't counsel passivity. It just means wait for the opportunity that the Lord uh, gives. Uh, and there's that passage in uh, Luke chapter 14, verses 7 to 11, that says when you go into a wedding feast, take the lower place. And the person might come along and say, well, come on, you shouldn't be in there, you should be in a higher place. Don't take the higher place, but you might be embarrassed to say, well, you know, you really shouldn't be there. You gotta move down to this lower place in the banquet. Uh, whoever wants to exalt themselves will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. We can have a specific calling, a life task, or life task that emerges over time. Like, say, for Oz Guinness, uh, his purpose has been to interpret the culture to the church and the church to the culture. <clears throat> now, he's exercised that in a number of different jobs. Uh, it may be that you have not yet found where that uh, space is, where, where you can... Uh, do that or found out what a general calling you have. I would say I, I found, I believe from the Lord what my calling is, but, and it's this, to impact key leaders, cities, networks, and ministries to help facilitate spiritual renewal and transformation. Now, now that sounds very grandiose and I believe it was something that the Lord gave to me and I know I can't do it all as one person, but as, as I've pursued it, I've gotten opportunity after opportunity to be working with groups of people and help be a catalyst or help facilitate uh, some large networks of people to be able to move people in the direction of uh, change, not only nationally, but internationally, through a group called Transform World, through the Global Cities Initiative, through uh, various other places. Uh, but there, there are times where the Lord may lead you to a, a specific area. Maybe that hasn't happened yet, uh, but it could happen where you find a, a, a purpose for your life, that you can define it and find ways to express it in perhaps under different jobs, but you nevertheless know what you're about. You know uh, what, you, what your purpose is. You know what your gifts are. Uh, not, you don't think of them more highly than you want, or you don't think of them as less than you want. Uh, I think a recovery of calling is essential for the church and for the nation. Uh, I know in many ways, in doing these vocational interviews, uh, I've found people that are, are working in all different kinds of arenas. Uh, and I think God calls people for every specific place in the body and also for every specific place within the corporate flow chart. For instance, I've met a janitor that I did a vocational interview with, and he was absolutely made and called to be a janitor, and he absolutely loved uh, the kind of work he did as a janitor in a specific school. He loved to make those floors shine. 
Uh, I've met people that are made or created to be CEOs that I've interviewed recently. There's no doubt that that's what they were made for. Uh, I've met people that are made for support. Uh, one woman, the metaphor that stood out was powder puff football. She, she loved to be the offensive guard, uh, blocking for the, the quarterback and the halfbacks to enable them to uh, be successful. Uh, and there are many other positions that we could talk about. In any case, uh, you need to find where your gifts are and find the shape of what they are and be able to pursue them. Uh, we need to be in a nation that's ab able to be called outside of ourselves to be what God has created us to be.